the bad guy comes to the head of the paramilitary forces and whispers something into his ear and they leave. And he turns to my grandfather and says, Mr. Lubetsky, I spared your family because you were always kind to me. And every holiday you gave me my bottle of snaps and every morning you looked at my eyes and you treated me with respect and were kind to me. So I'm sparing you, but leave before I change my mind. And they, that night they had to pack really quickly and go to the ghetto. So for me, this story is incredibly important because I exist because of the kindness of a person that was otherwise evil. This was not a good guy. And yet, he rose up to show some humanity at a critical point. Daniel, thanks for joining us on the American Optimist. I'm very pleased to be here, Joe. It's awesome to have you here. Daniel's become a, a good, good friend. He, had, you, we also, you also have roots in Texas, of course. And uh, and Daniel, you're so you're you're famously the founder of of Kind Bar, a multi-billion dollar snack company. And uh, you you grew up between Mexico and Texas, is that right? I I was born in Mexico City, grew up there till I was 15 and a half, and then we moved to San Antonio, Texas. I lived in Texas for. Two years of high school, three years of college, a little bit abroad, and then I was in California, New York for a while. And 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 your father came to Mexico after escaping a concentration camp in, in Dachau, right? He didn't escape. He was liberated by American soldiers, which is a very important distinction, right? Because for me, every time I see a Marine or a person from the U.S. Armed Forces, it it touches me very personally because I wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the courage of people that literally risk their lives to travel thousands of miles away to liberate an entire continent from, you know, Nazism and fascism. And um, he was 15 and a half years old when he was liberated. How, 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 long, how long was he in the camp? He was about three years in the camp, but it was like a six-year ordeal. He was nine years old when the war started, yeah. and he was in... Um, Kovno, Lithuania, and first he was in a in in a ghetto. And then he was in one concentration camp, Schanzerlager, and then he was in Dachau. And then he was liberated by American soldiers. And uh, after you know being in a hospital to recuperate and and being like in a refugee camp, he immigrated to Mexico because it's the only place where he could find a way to get in. He wasn't in. able to get into America yet at the time. He couldn't get in. He couldn't get out before the war, and he was a little kid. But then also, uh, he didn't have anywhere to go. But my aunt and uncle, before the war, had uh, emigrated to Mexico, so he landed there. And, you know, your, your show is called The American Optimist, and I was thinking a lot about even just the... The name of the show frames our experiences, how, how you frame things and how you try to have an attitude. It's like all of what I do, sometimes I'm, you know, I'm a neurotic, worried Mexican-American Jew, worried about, you know, given my dad's background. But I also, a lot of people think I'm a very optimistic, very uh, positive person. And it's that I'm just determined to prevent what happened to my dad from happening. Again it really to shaped others. a lot of your life, knowing what happened to your father. Yeah, and uh, and my father is very much you. You know, he passed away, but you would have wanted to interview him because he went through one of the most dark periods in life, and he was just the sweetest, most jovial, most positive person, always trying to put a smile in people's faces and make people's lives. I better. guess nothing could seem quite so bad after having gone through that early in his life. Exactly, yeah. and he felt it was like a lease, you know, a new lease in his life. And, and, and so in terms of how this shaped your life, I understand in 1994, you, you founded PeaceWorks. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so PeaceWorks um, is a company, I started right after law school and I was a confused Mexican-American Jew trying to sell sundry tomato spreads made by Arabs and Israelis. And the concept was, and, and uh, it became, I started ventures all over, but I was not really focused. So I didn't really know what I was doing. I was selling, uh, food products without any background in, in food sales or any background in, in, in uh, that type of business. But it was a concept of using business as a force for bringing neighbors together, people from conflict regions having a vested interest in preserving those relationships because they're trading in commerce and profiting from if those relationships. If you align people's incentives to be friends, it's more likely they're going to get along. 
correct. And even more important, when people discover each other's humanity, you shatter stereotypes, and then you discover that there's no absolute evil. That it's, it's much easier to hate the other when you haven't actually met them. If you have a conversation, if you have a dinner, let alone if you're interacting, almost always, not always, but almost always, you, re, you discover each other's humanity. How did that work? Do you think you were able to have some success with that between Arabs and Israelis? Obviously, that's a pretty intractable problem. Well, you see, that we solve the conflict. So that, <laughs> now, at the micro level, it really does work. You know, we had ventures that we supported for 25 years. The partnerships we forged between Israelis and Palestinians and Jordanians and Egyptians and Turks and Arab Israelis and, Arab, uh, and Jewish Israelis stood steadfast throughout the vicissitudes of the conflict for over... 25 years and so it, it was even transgenerational like Yoel Benish and Abdullah Ghanem he Abdullah's uh, passed away his children maintained their relationship with Yoel same with their relationship with Turkey um, but at the macro level I mean the answer is it's a necessary but not sufficient condition for resolving conflict like economic relations and trade are very important but obviously many other things have to come together also are there a couple other things you think that you've you've learned that we could could have done differently or could be doing there, in terms of peace works? In terms of yeah, in terms, in of, terms sol- of in terms of resolving. solving that conflict. There's many other things to, to teach us a little bit how to think about the. Yeah. You, you've thought about this a lot. Like what are what's some of the ontology of, of what, what's needed to fix these problems? Yeah, and then I also want to tell you about my failures at peace works because I find that uh, remembering your failures is actually very useful and gives you better contrast for uh, the things right than just saying all the things you got right and I had plenty of failures with peace work. But in terms of the the conflict, um, I'm fundamental, you know, I also built a movement called One Voice. And again, it was this uh, an example of a confused Mexican-American Jew trying to have the temerity to say that we could build a grassroots movement for Israelis and Palestinians. And I did it, of course, in partnership with Israelis and Palestinians. But the first thing that it taught me, uh, actually, because you chose the American optimist I want to start with highlighting, was you can do anything. And, and particularly when people think that you're crazy and that you make no sense, you might be onto something. And if you really believe something, you need to be careful, you need to research it, you need to be very, very thorough in your analysis. But if you have gone through that analysis and it, and it makes sense, don't give up because people think that it's too ambitious a goal. Like, you know, ultimately, like Margaret Mead wrote, uh, you know, it's only people that make change, ultimately. It's like for those who, you know, never doubt the that a handful of people can make a difference. In fact, that's all it ever does in history. It is a handful of people. I've experienced that, that too. A small number of people doing something very ambitious can sometimes create a reality that no one else thinks change. And I mean, what we did with Peace Rooks, what we did with One Voice, it had a much bigger impact than just, you know, my Peace Rooks ventures were never more than a handful of millions of dollars. But the concept of them inspired so much more that's happening still today. There's many more ventures that followed it. And One Voice reintroduced the concept of moderation into Israeli and Palestinian society. The the word moderation in Hebrew, metuniut, when I was starting this movement to empower moderate voices and fight extremism, and I was trying to search for for the language to use, I said, how do you say moderates in Hebrew? And my friends would say, well, it's metunim, but you can't really use that word because it's a biblical word. People don't really use it in modern Hebrew language. I'm like, well, what other word can we use? And we couldn't find one. So we started using metunyut. And today, metunyut is now, it's part of the lexicon. And prime ministers and presidents and uh, members of Knesset started using it. And the President Abbas and uh, Prime Minister Olmer and all of them were using that language when we built the. Well, speaking of Metunia, I I want to I maybe want to jump uh, to uh, to the to the latest project actually because that seems like it's pretty tied to it in some ways. And you, you're obviously you're very worried about the polarization going on in our country, and there's there's people on both sides who who you know don't talk to each other and and are quite extreme. And you see your launching starts with us to try to try to maybe bring Metuniot to, to America. Can you tell us a little bit about Starts With Us? Yeah, you're doing very well with pronouncing Metuniot. Um, <laughs> well, I'll start with a, a stark uh, comment that we talked about how my dad's experience forged my commitment to try to build bridges between people and the common thread in everything I do is that. But I always thought that the way I would contribute 
to preventing what happened to my dad from happening and to other human beings was abroad. I never thought that I would be worried about the United States. Remember, I came from Mexico where we didn't have rule of law, where we didn't have, you know, uh, the freedom that we have in America. I'm still very worried about the problems there today. I I assume you are too, and Mexico is even worse. Super worried, super worried. But, um, But I don't take for granted what we have in this country. It is the most exceptional country in history. Yeah. Yes, we have a lot of things that are not perfect, but when you compare to an, any other system, we've really built something incredible. And yet, these things are more fragile than we realize, and they all rely on a social fabric, on certain pieces of the American culture that when I came to America, I fell in love with. You know, I remember coming in, living in Texas in the 80s and learning <clears throat> that you could have, you know, Republicans and Democrats deeply disagree on policy, but then they went to dinner and they were friends. And they didn't, you know, demonize one another. They found a way to respect each other's um, opinions. I just hosted last week Senator Murkowski and Senator Sinema at, a, at an event, and they talked about how one of the fundamental problems in our society today is the assumption of evil intent. You you think that the other side is wrong and is bad and you infer negative intent to them. And you don't I, I really saw that coming from San Francisco. If you disagreed, people hate each other. And what's one thing I like about Texas, by the way, is even people I disagree with, they still invite you over to dinner sometimes. And so Texas still has some of that fabric left, it feels like. I think across our country and across the political spectrum, left, center and right, we're all developing negative habits, partly because of the advent of social media and the echo chambers and the algorithms that basically make us only receive the information it really we pulls hear. us apart because it puts us in a bubble huh yeah and the the cable news it, we, we end up like feeling like we have all the answers and how can the other side not understand what we so clearly understand and we've become really bad at using information to inform our beliefs rather than affirm our beliefs now all of what we do is just absorb stuff well, it's, to ego. Make it's, it's, feel it's, it's ego right you have your identity tied to these beliefs and every time you hear something you're, you're supporting your ego and saying look how good i am look look how great i am and you know it's, it's, it's a tough thing and there i mean there's many reasons for it and we can discuss it but the unforgiving judgmentalism that exists in america today is is very very concerning it scares me it reminds me of the stuff we were trying to deal with in the Arab-Israeli conflict, and Joe, this is interesting. This is very interesting. When we would bring together Palestinians and Israelis at 1 a.m. in the morning, trying to hash out agreements with them uh, through our process with the One Voice Movement, um, and we were staying till 1 a.m. negotiating certain wording on documents, mm-hmm. it was tough. But we made more progress than when I'm talking to people that support Trump and people that oppose Trump. It is extraordinarily difficult to move people one inch. To try to, but but the answer for how to move people is to focus them on where we want to go and what we want as it, a people. It, it reminds me a little bit of what you hear of the religious wars three hundred, four hundred, five hundred years ago, where the other side just was just evil and had to be destroyed. And it's almost like it sounds like there's something in us as, as like there's something in humanity that's tribal that likes to think in terms of tribes and wiping out the other tribe. Is it something we evolved with? Like what's what, where's this coming from? We we are definitely all tribal. There's no way for you to avoid the human aspiration to connect with others. But the problem that we have now is that the tribes now lack diversity of thought. It's a very, very dangerous problem. By the way, this is not my insight. It's one of our founding partners from uh, Starts With Us led me to this insight. Uh, uh, and it's, it's striking to me, though, I've been thinking about this a lot, that we now are in such homogeneous groups of thinking that if you're on the native is right or on the woke left or even in across the spectrum again you think because those algorithms are serving you what you want to hear that there's only one truth and it's your truth and we've lost the ability to be curious and to ask questions and to you know to your listeners today i'm going to do an exercise that i do uh, often with myself and with my friends like when was the last time that you changed your mind about something fundamental when was the last time that data came into you and said, oh, I was wrong about assuming that this was the right policy or this was the right answer? 
And all of us struggle with saying, yes, I, all of us once in a blue moon do it, but we should do it more frequently. And it's okay to evolve and let information help shape you and, and help you realize and, and we're just very bad at it's that. very it's very it's very hard again i think i think it's because it's been, maybe i think today when more of our identities exist online and, and more of the things we're doing online we, we we come to identify our ego with some of our positions and so it's very hard to let go of your ego and to and to empathize with the other side well the other thing that uh, and we haven't talked about what we're going to do about it which starts with us but the other thing leading to it you know i'm sure you noticed 10, 15 years ago, all of us noticed that in these online chats where people were not connecting with each other as we are right now as human beings, where people were not breaking bread together mm -hmm. or talking in person, the anonymity and impersonality of these internet chat rooms allowed people to let out these really angry bursts of hatred and like they they related to one another very differently than it, if they it, were facing it dehumanized i think there's a big part of our brain where the neurons are actually empathizing with the other person because when you're looking at someone's face your brain's trying to empathize and think what they're thinking and that doesn't happen when you're online correct and and but the problem we have as a society is we thought okay you know that's just going to be relegated to those dark recesses of the internet it's not going to come to real life but that was a big mistake because we are all a product of our daily behaviors and of our daily habits. If every day you're a jerk and you treat people with disdain online, how do you assume that it's not going to seep into the consciousness of, of, of our daily lives? So we really, really need to work on our daily habits to, to improve ourselves and our society. So season two of American Optimist, which we're in, is all about solutions. And so we got to work on our daily habits. But what, what else starts with us doing? How are we, how are yeah, we doing so this? Yeah, so starts with us is fundamentally a movement that relies on two type of building blocks for us to elevate uh, American society, and eventually it's going to go global. One is skill building. You know, the cool thing about America is that when you ask people about their values, it's shocking how much consensus there is across the left, center, and right on what's important to us. All Americans care about helping people that have been left behind. All Americans care about, or the vast majority, about protecting uh, our rule of law and about nobody being above the law. Americans care about a level playing field. Americans, it's just when it comes to our daily habits and how we manifest those values that because of the things we mentioned, it's kind of broken. But I think if we start providing skill building tools on a daily basis in a gamified way, like we're, you know, there's a lot of good content out there um, that already exists, but it's very academic. And, and, and what we're doing is turning it into fun games where we give you tools so that you can practice. How do you deliberate with more curiosity? How do you relate with more empathy? How do you collaborate with more courage? In a way that's not just good for society, but good for you to become a good entrepreneur, to build better companies, more resilient companies. Because this stagnating inability for people to debate with one another is bad for business too. If people are scared to express their opinions because they're going to be canceled or they can't build a good business if, if they're not going to be able to disagree. And so, so I love that you're bringing entrepreneurship and business in, into this along with empathy and everything else. It, it sounds like in your career, you know, after building uh, PeaceWorks and you're doing the snack foods with Israelis and Palestinians, you started Kind in 2004. Did you just stumble into learning about the snack business because you were trying to solve world peace and, and, and then you got and then you, you made a multi-billion dollar snack business? Like, like how, 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 just let's seek into that for a second. Like how did you, you had, it's a very competitive market. How, how, did, how did you win there? And, and I want to relate it back to understand, you know, what you Yeah, well, you it. asked earlier about the lessons in the Middle East. I will do a, a few hours on, 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 on what we need to do for that ecosystem. But um, also the lessons for PeaceWorks as a business were plenty. I made, I did everything wrong. That's how we get better as you screw up. Yeah. Yeah. But I had a lot of grit. I had a lot of determination. But I had what, no what, 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 were, what were a couple of the biggest mistakes? I'm curious to hear. The first one was that I I I thought that if I could break through a wall, I was going to succeed. And what I didn't figure out is right next to the wall, there was a door and I just needed to open the knob and go around it. So I had a lot of grit, but no wit. And the and the, the one of my fundamental lessons is focus and discipline and strategy. I mean, they're as important as that sheer grit that entrepreneurs do need, but it's not enough. So I was all over the place. I was trying to start ventures, literally, Joe, in not just in the Middle East, but in Sri Lanka between Sinhalese and Tamils, in um, South Africa, in Durban, in Indonesia, in, in a 
Muslim, Christian, Buddhist. So you had crazy like energy, to, but you were doing too. Sounds like me too much. I was too in love with the social mission and not respectful enough of the business. I was too in love with trying to do like, and I was. I had this sun-dried tomato spread made by Arabs and Israelis, and I would try to place it at Bloomingdale's and Macy's, as well as in the convenience store, in the corner shop. I had no focus, I had no discipline. I just wanted to be everything to everybody and be everywhere. I ended up being nothing to nobody. I didn't have focus in our branding. I didn't have focus in our product strategy. I didn't have, it was a lot of mistakes about innovation, about product development, about brand development. You know, a brand is a promise. And a great brand is a promise well kept. And for you to win in consumer marketing, what is a brand essentially? It tells you, it's a shortcut for, hey, I'm going to deliver this to you. You can trust me that I'm going to deliver this to you. But if one day you're trying to deliver this and the other day you're trying to deliver this, it's useless. So with kind, we figured that out. And that made all the difference. We were very disciplined. As I was trekking through the Middle East and through all these places trying to make peace among people. And I was skipping lunch or dinner in my office and working till midnight or 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. or going door to door to uh, supermarkets all over America. I didn't have a good snack that I could feel good about, uh, about like eating healthy snacks on the go. And that's how we conceived the idea for Kind. And we were very disciplined. We didn't launch too many products. People were like, once we had success, everybody's like, oh, launch more lights. And we're like, no, no, no. We're going to stick to what we have and do that right. And we didn't go into, try to be in every channel. We st- stayed in the right channels at the beginning. We we were much, much more focused and disciplined. And also we figured out the branding and the product. Most important, it was great product. You know, it was something people wanted. It was a healthy snack whose ingredients you could see and pronounce. And and, the, and and so so that's become very successful and you're you're still the executive chairman of kind I actually recently uh, stepped down as executive chairman and I'm now the chief impact officer but it's basically I did a, we had a very significant partnership with Mars where they're helping us grow globally we're now in 35 countries we're growing into many other categories and as part of that partnership I'm still very deeply involved I still work with our team on a daily basis but i'm also able to do other things such as starts with us and other things that i care a lot about so you so, you, so you've had your big business success and now i think it's fascinating it starts with us you're not only addressing the societal problems of polarization but you also want to inspire and teach people how to be entrepreneurs it sounds like yeah starts with us well it starts with us is a recognition that these essential skill sets that have made America as amazing as it has been up to date are under thread. And they're skills that help you to build a vibrant democracy, to be a good parent, to be a good sibling, to be a good entrepreneur. Because, for example, uh, deliberating with curiosity. It's not just about what we're talking about, people being comfortable uh, disagreeing so that truth can emerge like Thomas Jefferson and Madison and all talked about the importance of the marketplace of ideas. It's also important for business effectiveness. I've seen it way too much happen that even in very successful businesses, it's an even bigger threat that then people don't want to tell the CEO when he or she is wrong or they create a culture where you you don't want to disagree because you're going to offend someone or you want to be too polite. And one of the things that I found out uh, about there's a huge difference between being nice and polite and being honest. You could be kind about things, but you don't want to you don't want to pull the punches because you don't want to hurt people's yeah, feelings. Yeah, be, being honest requires courage. Being kind and honest requires enormous amounts of courage, and people tend to confuse these things because they think that being nice is a weakness, but it's a very different thing from things that require action, like being kind, like being honest. Like to be kind, it requires action. Like if you see a person in need, to be kind and stretch out your hand to help them, it requires a lot of courage to do that. If you see a person being bullied, you can be nice and not bully, but to be kind, you need to help stop the bullying. If you're nice, you're polite, and but if you're kind, you're gonna tell that person, Look, you know, you have something stuck in yeah. your teeth, or you like it requires a, a certain level of strength. To put yourself out there a little bit. To put yourself out there. And it's the same thing with feedback. And feedback is a very important piece of success in business and creating a culture where there's straws, where there's openness, when people can. If you assume negative intent, how are people going to feel comfortable 
asking questions. It happens in our schools today where children might be scared to ask a question because they don't want to be judged. But Especially around any kind of sensitive issues that are politically correct, right? People just yeah, say, you, you can't ask about them at all. You're supposed to just go along and nod is what you're taught. An ultimate that's terrible for everybody. It's not just terrible for a particular group. It's terrible for everybody because if kids can't ask questions, if adults can't ask questions, A, how are we going to get to truth? But B, people are going to just be virtue signaling and going along because they're at, scary and at least a lot of To me, at least a lot of scary things too because a lot of people, especially on the right, are afraid to ask questions in public because they'll be in trouble, but then they end up embracing a lot of what conspiracy theories that aren't necessarily very, very intelligent because they don't have had a chance to to debate and challenge them. I think debate and challenging these things makes them smarter. You know Exactly. I mean, you just pointed to a very important thing that everybody needs to understand. Number one, our inability to create a con an environment where we're more forgiving and less judgmental starts creating an environment of intimidation where everybody on the left and the right start moving to the extremes and that lack of diversity yeah, they, yeah, of they thought. Yeah, they both embrace crazy, crazy things. They both embrace things that they're like, Wait, have you thought about the logic of your position? No, I can't because if somebody brings it up, they're going to be they're other. Gonna, they're they're going to get angry. A, yeah, if anyone would debate some of these crazy views on the far right and far left, and they actually listen, they probably wouldn't actually believe them anymore. But they're afraid to debate the them. The far huh? right and the far left have a lot more in common than they realize, and it's that rigidity. And what we need to do is encourage everybody across the political spectrum to adopt. You know, what does it mean to deliberate with curiosity? Try to read news sources from magazines or news publications that disagree with you. Try to see where you can find something that it's a fair point on their side. Then go to your own news sources and say, think more critically and absorb. And we give you fun toolkits for you to play games with. Okay, here's a news source. Like, what doesn't make sense? And so find the whole. So you're trying to arguments. gamify this idea of embracing and, and challenging yourself with yeah. the other side. And also just develop fun habits. Like, you know, think uh, this week we're going to approach the world as kids. Like, deliberate with curiosity. Like, children don't have a compunction about asking you questions. And sometimes the questions are embarrassing and sometimes they get it wrong. But that's how they learn. And like, chill, dude. And also there's a lot of a, just have fun. I mean, just... Just relax. At, at Kind, we uh, we had a president named John Leahy. He's one of my favorite people in the world. And he used to say, Daniel, these kids just need to develop a thick skin. And it's a, I used to like not get it as much as I do now, but all of us in society, we cannot be so hypersensitive about somebody making a mistake and assuming evil intent in them because they made a mistake. We need to understand that every single human being is not perfect. There is no perfect human being. Every one of us is going to make a mistake. So to assume evil intent, to cancel them and destroy their lives and assume that they're the worst, it, it's just... And so what we're going to do to overcome that is like provide games, provide opportunities for interaction. And then there's also a lot of work for storytelling. Besides skill building, it's storytelling. It's sharing, interviewing people like you and hundreds of others that are joining our movement that have achieved the normal success by deploying these tools of deliberating with curiosity, relating with empathy, collaborating with courage, and how in their lives have they achieved, whether they're, we have a ton of celebrities like Will I Am and NFL players and uh, incredible thinkers like Adam Grant and Amanda Ripley and just a, a huge spectrum of people across all politics, across all segments of society that have achieved incredible things by embracing these unorthodox I, skills. I, 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 yeah, I, I, so, I, so curiosity, empathy, and courage is really, you know, I think those are, those are obviously really good values. I'm, I'm curious on empathy. Are there areas where you find you struggle with having empathy with certain things that you, that are just really frustrating to you? Yes, all the time, all the time. I I, I think every one of us uh, can grow on these things. Every one of us, even people that try to practice all these things. Um, you know, somebody told me recently. I think it was Roy Spence that said like you need to love the people that are hard to love because the ones that are easy to love that's not a big deal. Like God put in this place people that are very different and you need to try your best to develop empathy for the people that you don't have that. Because, and I'm going to tell you a, a somewhat powerful story to make, to drive this point. Um, when my dad was about nine or 10 years old, maybe 11 years old, uh, the superintendent in, by, by now the war had started, but he hadn't reached their, 
their town. Or it had reached their town, but they were still living in, in, in an apartment building in Kovno. And the superintendent approached my dad, 10 or 11 years old, and told him, are you hungry? Do you want me to show you where there's some food? And my dad said, yes, please. And he walked him to a pile of dead bodies, a pile of dead Jewish bodies, and said, there, you know, those are Jews. Grab a piece of them, cut a piece for yourself, for your sandwich. And my dad was 10 or 11 years old. Wow. And so this guy was not a good guy, right? That's the background. Now, fast forward a few months later, the paramilitary forces round out all the Jewish families and exterminate them all. They get to my family. This is the last Jewish family in the building. They go into the apartment uh, where my family lived. They take my grandmother in the back. And my dad talks about this in a YouTube video that I posted on my channel. And he was little. He didn't understand what was going on. But they take my grandmother in the back for 30, 40 minutes. So you can assume what was going on there. And then they come out and they bring them down where all the other Jewish people have been uh, eliminated. And they're about to shoot them where the superintendent, the bad guy, comes to the head of the paramilitary forces and whispers something into his ear, and they leave. And he turns to my grandfather and says, Mr. Lubetsky, I spared your family because you were always kind to me. And every holiday you gave me my bottle of snaps, and every morning you looked at my eyes and you treated me with respect and were kind to me. So I'm sparing you, but leave before I change my mind. And they that night... They had to pack really quickly and go to the ghetto. So for me, this story is incredibly important because I exist because of the kindness of a person that was otherwise evil. This was not a good guy. And yet, he rose up to show some humanity at a critical point. And so my point is, every human being has an opportunity for growth. Every human being is complex. Every one of us makes mistakes. And to your point about empathy, we need to try our darndest to try to build bridges with those that are different from us because those are the people that we need to, that we need to work on ourselves and on them to try to build those bridges. We both love America and believe in it, but against that sort of darkness in the world, how, how do you have hope and how are we going to fix these problems? Yeah, well, the best thing we have going for us is that First of all, we have a nation that over hundreds of years has been the most extraordinary experiment in, in, you know, in human history. And we do have an incredible reservoir of goodwill. Um, we just did a survey where over 90% of Americans felt that there's a way to change things for the better. Everybody's very concerned, but they also recognize the huge opportunity to, and the commitment, like everybody wants everybody's sensing it across the spectrum there's something wrong but they they all want to be part of the journey so I, I think we're going to build an incredible movement because everybody across all politics religions that they were all of us want to to overcome these breakages that have happened over the last 10 15 years so i have very high confidence that we're going to actually turn and regain a lot of these magical things that we have. And if you go to starts with us, it starts with dot us, you'll, you'll see incredibly inspiring people from Bernice King, the daughter of Martin Luther King Jr. to just an incredible group of icons that, that represent a lot of different perspectives, but all joining a commitment that it starts with us, that every one of us can do our little small part to make this world a little bit kinder, to make it a little bit more, little bit. and if we just move there in ourselves, the needle a tiny bit, we're gonna transform our social norms and actually uh, make America continue to be the, the land of opportunity. You know, I came with, you know, a lot more than my father came into, but I built, you know, a multi-billion dollar company out of, a $10,000 investment. I helped bring people together in so many different fashions and it would have not been possible in any other country. And I think still the United States has the most potential, not just for our own people, but for the world. We have to invest in, in, in ourselves and in our country because we are the light for the rest of the world. And if we send darkness, then I think it's going to impact the rest of the world too. So we have a responsibility to to build this together. That's really inspiring. America is very lucky to attract people like you to help, help us help us keep who we are.
Thank you, Joe. And thank you for doing the American Optimist. I think the most important thing about your show is that framework, is that mindset. Because if you approach things with a determination to do better, your whole attitude and your whole way that you see the world is going to be in, in that I agree. We create, we create the future we envision together. So we need to all envision how it's going to all work. Attitude is destiny. I'm a proud supporter and signatory of Starts With Us and really, really glad to get to be involved with it. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you, Joe.